good to see everyone. Let's have a word of prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the day that you have blessed us with and the week that you have given us. We're thankful for the pretty weather that we've had. Uh, we're thankful for this opportunity to come together tonight to open up your word, to study from the life of Samuel, even as Samuel was a little boy. Help us to learn the lessons from your word, from Holy Scripture. Help us to learn them and to apply them, and share them with others. We're so thankful that you are our Father. We're thankful for your holiness, your goodness. We're thankful for your love and your graciousness and your mercy. We're, we're so thankful for all of those traits of yours, even your discipline, knowing that you care for us, and that's why we are disciplined, that you love us. So we are so thankful for, for all that is good and perfect. It comes from your hand, and the reason it is good and perfect is because you are good and perfect. We are thankful for your son. We are thankful that you sent him to this earth, that you allowed him to go to the cross, and you allowed that cruelty to happen so that we could have the remission of our sins that the new covenant could be ushered in, and we are thankful to be a part of it, that we are thankful to be on this side of the cross, that the times of the shadows are behind us, and now as we look as we look to Scripture, we recognize what those things were a shadow of, and we are thankful for all the blessings found in your Son. Father, please be with those who are not here. Um, be with those who are struggling, physically, those who are struggling spiritually, and help us to always remember that we don't always know when we're struggling spiritually. So, so we pray that we're always looking into your word and examining ourselves, and that we are our brothers and sisters keepers uh, as we look carefully, because we don't want anyone to come short of, of their eternal prize, ourselves or anyone else either. We hope uh, that we are edified for being here tonight and that you are glorified. Um, be with us. We pray all things are, are done in a, in a way that is well-pleasing in your sight. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. Help us to always have the humility that we need to have and to be cognizant of the fact that we, we rely upon your grace and the grace that is found in your Son. So please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Again, good to see everyone. We are in lesson number two. We are in 1 Samuel chapter 3 tonight. Appreciate you being here. Hello, Nancy. Good to see everyone. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Last week we spoke about Eli and Eli's sons. And a prophecy has been made as a man of God came to Eli and told him, told him that things were not going to go well, needless to say. But now we're ready for the Lord speaking to Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. It came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again, and he went to lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And so Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, so he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. I wanted to get y'all's thoughts first off on the fact, I don't know how old Samuel is at this point, but he's described as a boy. 
how do you feel about the Lord speaking to him? And the scenario that I was playing out in my mind was how would you feel if things were not good in the congregation here and the Lord spoke to Jackson? <laughs> and the Lord tells, Jack, tells Jackson something's happening. And that's even actually a stretch because I think Samuel's younger than Jackson. How old is Jackson and Jackson? 13? I think Samuel's quite a bit younger than Jackson at this point. Um, how would you feel if the Lord spoke to Jackson? Uh, okay, by what, I'm, what I mean by that is the Lord's not talking to you. <laughs> how do you feel about that? I mean, the high priest is in there bedding down for the night. And the Lord is talking to the young whippersnapper in the other room. What were you going to say, Rudy? And Samuel is going to have instruction. And so that's the follow-up question, because this isn't just a casual conversation between the Lord and Samuel. This is, this is not good. <laughs> and so that's a pretty heavy burden on, frankly, a young kid, right? I, I mean, because he's going to have to go in, and Eli's going to say, what did the Lord tell you? And Samuel's afraid. And rightly so. The Lord is putting Samuel in the position of being the bearer of bad news. Now granted, has the man of God already spoken to Eli? Yes. So is this new news? No. But still, I was just thinking about that. That that's, um, that's a heavy burden to put on Samuel. And Eli, to his credit, which we talk all about Eli's faults, Eli, to his credit, says, whatever the Lord told you, so be it. Just tell me what he said. And that's what we'll get to that here in a, here in a minute. But I just wanted you to, to think about that. The, the account starts off, there's no widespread revelation in those days. Why was there no widespread revelation? Nobody cared. I mean, that's all it amounted to. Um, and, and that's, that's great sadness. There's just, there was no appetite for God's word. People didn't want to hear it. I mean, the people tried to tell Eli's kids, you know, his adult children, Hey, you shouldn't do that. Did they want to hear it? Nope. <laughs> people didn't want to hear it. So there's no widespread revelation in those, in those days. Uh, the time frame it's obviously late at night at some point in the middle of the night. Um, I'm not sure if the light in, in the notes I put, oh, you know, there's a passage in Exodus 27 about, uh, about the light. Don't know exactly when it would be extinguished, but obviously it's pretty late, pretty late. And so now he's, the Lord is drawing near to Samuel. Samuel and you can tell, and it, it makes the point there in verse 4, as he's, as he's going on, right? The Lord speaks to Samuel. And it makes the point there in verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. As this is going on, so the Lord, the Lord calls him, verse 4. The Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. So he runs into Eli. And my question, you know, we're familiar with the account. Why doesn't the Lord just say, hey, it's me, God? <laughs> Why doesn't the Lord just stop him and say, where are you going? Stop going in and speaking to Eli. Perhaps, maybe so. That's a good point. Um, sort of a test for Eli too. When it's all said and done, it's like, okay, Eli, you gonna you gonna find out, investigate? Go ahead, Bruce. Didn't uh, the chief come down for Peter? Right. Times? Right. It seems like uh, number three is maybe. Uh, Why did the sheet? Why why did the sheet come down? Because I don't think it's a magical number. Uh, 
but, but what is Peter? And by that I mean he's a little thick, <laughs> right? Peter's, he's a little thick, right? He's like, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a vision. He's hungry. The Lord says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter's like, not so, Lord. I'm... Right, right, right. It's not actually about the food. It's about the Gentiles. But the Lord doesn't say it's about the Gentiles. Peter has to figure that out. And so the Lord is trying to teach Peter. Now, what do you think the Lord's trying to do with Samuel? He's trying to teach him. He's trying to develop that relationship. Because as it stands right now, it makes the point, verse 7, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Maybe he didn't know his voice, the Lord's voice. Maybe he didn't know his voice. He's just, he's young. I mean, he's young. Eli's sons, they didn't know the Lord. Why didn't they know the Lord? Because they were rebellious cusses, and they ignored the Lord. There's a difference between ignoring the Lord and being ignorant of the Lord. And when we're just starting out, and we're just young, when we're just youngins ourselves, what are we? Like, we're ignorant. <laughs> through, through no fault of our own. We're just young. So one of the questions is going to be, because it says that Samuel ministered to the Lord, there in verse 1. Mm, yeah, Samuel, the boy ministered to the Lord. How could, what does it mean that he ministered to the Lord, and yet at the same time he did not know the Lord? What does that mean? Learning? Go ahead, Mark. You had your hand up a second ago, too. Right. Right. Martha. Martha was. Probably others. Um, anyway, trying to get get people's attention, and I, I I wonder if that's not also what the Lord's trying to do with Samuel, that when the Lord's speaking to him, as far as. Sheila, can I use your videos as a reference? What, one of the things you always close your videos out with is, what do children need to do? Listen to the grown-ups. Well, what do you think Samuel was supposed to do? Listen to the grown-ups. Now, what's the problem right now? Uh, the grown-ups are having a lot of trouble. Is there a higher authority than the grown-ups? And all of a sudden, the Lord, it's like, oh, <laughs> it's like Samuel... Let's just say for the sake of saying it, he's eight. Well, what's he doing? He's doing whatever Eli tells him to do. And it's like, okay, now all of a sudden you're introduced to a higher authority. It's like you you knew of him. Now the relationship's going to grow. Go ahead, Rudy. I mean, he's just young. He's been dedicated since birth. After he's weaned, he's taken to the temple. But he's he's young. He's real young. And he's going to have to grow up pretty quick. And um, I, I, w- I want to bring in a point that's going to happen later on. How hard of a life do you think Samuel... Yeah, let's put it like that. How hard of a life do you think Samuel had? I mean, beyond that, what I'm thinking of is, was he raised at home by his parents? You know, we were we were talking, um, Bruce and Mark and I were talking about graduation before services. From from after Samuel's weaned, where is he? It's like you're in the temple, so 
for that time, you're in the temple with Eli and everything, everything else that's going on. And it's a hard existence. That, that's how he grew up. We know at some point he got married. I don't know when he got married. But eventually, one, one of the questions we're going to deal with, probably two lessons from now, what is, what is it that leads to Israel asking or demanding for demanding a king? Yeah, his sons aren't doing what's right. And to just make that point, Samuel has is going to be, we're just getting into it now. He's going to be working for the Lord from a young age. I don't know why his children chose not to follow in his footsteps exactly, because they're going to end up perverting justice and taking bribes and things like that. And the people aren't going to be real happy about it. And my, my point, I, as an application, I always appreciated a fella one time at, at a congregation. He was an older fella. And he said, you better not spend all your time here. You have a family at home. You need to make sure you're spending time with your family, with your children, and with your wife. Do not dedicate 24-7 to this. You know, he wasn't trying to, he was just trying to get it, get me to understand. And, and I appreciated that thought and that point. And I guess my point is simply, could you easily see Samuel neglecting his children? Not saying he did. Not. Samuel. Samuel's children don't follow in his footsteps. I don't know why. I don't know why. My point is just Samuel from the time... Frankly, he was he was a kid. It's it, it was a hard life. It, it was a hard life, and it would have been easy. It, it would have been a. L- let me put it another way. Saul of Tarsus is said to be the chosen vessel, right? Ananias, go. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name. And I've always wondered, why Saul? And just imagine all the places that Saul of Tarsus went, all the places the Apostle Paul went. How much harder would that have been with a wife and children? That would have been extremely hard. Paul goes, he's not married. Guess who's with him, at least part of the way? Barnabas. Guess what Barnabas doesn't have either? He's not married either. What, how much more difficult would it have been for Peter, who we know we know Peter had a wife? It's not out of the question to think he had children. It would have been hard for Peter to do what Paul had done. Samuel is judging. Samuel's going to be judging Israel. It's a hard life, and it's even more difficult if you're married with children. And that's that's what he is. Thoughts or or anything about that? Go ahead, Bruce. We learned parenting skills from our parents. Right. And if he was separated from them at an early right. age. Right. Right. What did he learn about right. parenting? Right. Yeah. It would have been hard. Yeah. It would have been hard. Basically, the male role model in his life was Eli. That would have been hard. Um, Nancy, did you have your hand up? No. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like the only male role model is someone who when he hears the Ark of the Covenant is gone. God says, I'm holding Eli accountable for this. And um anyway, but Eli, to his credit, Eli gives good counsel. Samuel comes in, he keeps thinking that that Eli's calling for him, and Eli's like, No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. By the way, this is not the first time Eli, he's not as presumptuous as he is with Hannah. You know, with Hannah, sees her mouth moving, he assumes she's drunk, and Hannah has to correct him. With Samuel, finally after the third time, he says, okay, it's the Lord, and he tells him what he needs to do. Go lie down, it shall be. If he calls you, you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Um, Just to make the point in the outline, this is more than just hearing. 
this is, I will obey. It's like when Samuel says, your servant hears. What he is saying is, my dad, dad always makes the analogy, dad was in the Navy. And when your commanding officer gives you an order in the Navy, what's the, uh, what do you say back? Aye, aye. And it's like, it's like, I will hear it, I hear it, and I will obey it. It's like, that's what I will do. <laughs> and it's, you know, that's when speak for your servant hears. And that it's more than just hearing. It's, okay, go ahead, Mark. Right. Right. Something. Something. Yeah. To use that language. Um, all right. Anything else before we read on? Okay. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him, and he said, it is, uh, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. All right, so he tells him, I'm going to do something. Now once again, and out of curiosity, the man of God comes to Eli. We have the advantage because we can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 3 and read it. So my question is, do you think Eli shared what the man of God had told him? Probably not. Don't know. Don't know. But the Lord, when he speaks to Samuel, he says, verse 13, I have told him that I will judge his house forever. So if Eli had not told Samuel, the Lord told Samuel. And so it's, it's like, okay. And so he's the Lord's going to do something that when people hear it, their ears will tingle. But what tidbit is the Lord still not revealing? He's not mentioning the ark. He just keeps mentioning Eli's house. And it's okay. And... um why is that? <laughs> Out of curiosity. Why do you think the Lord doesn't say the ark's about to be lost? Go ahead, Rudy. Let, let's pause right there for a second. That business about, it's like, no sacrifice is going to atone for this. This is, this is done. You remember what is said about Job in the first chapter when he's being introduced, what Job does for his children? Praise and does it mention sacrifice too? Basically, and he, doesn't he say like, just in case? This is Job chapter 1. 
verse 5, that Job would sin and sanctify them, and he'd rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that the sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, thus Job did regularly. And it's, it's an interesting passage just to, to make this point. It's obviously in the Lord's in the Lord's um, I can't think of what I want to say. It's up to the Lord whether he respects Job's sacrifice or not for those children. We don't we don't know. Job offers it for the children, and it's up to the Lord whether he's going to respect that offering or not. With Eli, the Lord says, uh uh-uh, uh, there's no sacrifice that's going to make up for this. It's it's done. It's done. So at that point, uh, that has some finality to it. <laughs> and um, might consider that idea. But the Lord still, I, I was wondering concerning the ark. If you tell them the ark is about to be lost, what are they going to do with the ark? Either hide it or not let it out of their eyes. But when it comes time, as they're about to do battle against the Philistines, guess what gets called for? The ark. So I wonder if that's why the Lord didn't let him into that little tidbit. Because in in the grand scheme of things, is it the Lord's will, just pardon that phrase, is it the Lord's will that the ark be lost? Hopefully you know what I mean by that. (laughs) It's like, yeah, he's punishing He's punishing Israel it is what he's doing. And so he's going to use the Philistines. Israel's going to lose to the Philistines, and the Philistines are going to take the ark. But the Lord's not letting them know that. He's just condemning Eli and his house. And he tells Samuel, I have told him. I don't know. You look at chapter 2, 3, 4. Chapter 3, we have the time stamp, Samuel's a boy. But at the end of chapter 3, what is Samuel doing? He's growing. I don't know how much time passes between chapter 3 and chapter 4. That I don't know. I'm not sure if there's any way we could know. Um, Anyway, you might think about that idea. But the Lord has said it, and it's coming to pass. Samuel, as as the boy, he is afraid to tell Eli. Like I said, that, that would have been a heavy load for anybody, let alone let alone a a young boy. And so Samuel is learning from a young age, and this is is what it is. is. When the Lord is talking to his disciples, and he says, do not fear those who kill the body, I'll tell you who you should fear. And it's, you fear those who can deal with body and soul. Samuel, I know you're afraid to speak to Eli. You better have more godly fear (laughs) than fear of him. Because Samuel's afraid. He's afraid to tell him. And it's like, Samuel, if you don't tell him, you're getting started off on the wrong foot. Because what's the temptation for Samuel? He's eight years old. Either to lie or silence or sugarcoat it. You remember what Paul tells the Ephesian elders when he calls for them? I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. You know what a lot of folks do? (laughs) They don't declare the whole counsel of God. Because if you declare the whole counsel of God, guess what happens? (laughs) Uh, People get upset. People get upset. And that's that's just the reality of it. And Samuel, from this time forward, what's the lesson? Whatever the Lord tells you, that's what you say. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. So Eli, once again to his credit, he says, Whatever it is, tell me. Now verse 7, God do so, or verse 17, pardon me, God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things. How do you feel about that quote? Yeah, I don't care for that quote a whole lot. Because Samuel's a good boy. And I know what Eli's boys are doing. (laughs) And I know when when Eli speaks to his his sons, what does he say? 
why do you do such things? For I hear from the people what, you know, when he talks to Samuel, the eight-year-old, he says, the Lord will smite you if you don't tell me. It's like, <laughs> anyway, um, I was just curious what y'all thought of it. Yeah, probably so. I just don't like his tone. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, but Samuel, he tells him. And Eli, again, to Eli's credit, Eli says, it is it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And... I was going to say, <clears throat> Jezebel says something right. similar to Elijah. Yep. And he runs for the hills. He's out of there, man. He's afraid. He puts a fear in him. Oh, oh, Bruce, don't open up that can of worms. <laughs> did did a daily video recently. <sighs> if y'all couldn't hear Bruce, when Jezebel says, I'm going to make your life like one of the prophets by tomorrow, all those prophets that have been killed on Mount Carmel, she says, I'm going to make you like one of those prophets by this time tomorrow. And Elijah runs. Y'all remember where Elijah runs to? He goes from Mount Carmel down to Beersheba. And that's where the Lord says, drink a little bit, eat a little bit. The journey's too great for you. And he keeps going and he goes to Mount Horeb. Now, what is Mount Horeb? That's Sinai. And so then the Lord is speaking to him on Sinai. And, and this is not, I don't think Elijah was running like Jonah was running. Jonah was just running away. And he was going to keep going. Elijah, it's like he's running to someplace. And I was just thinking about the fact, when Moses, in the book of Exodus, when Moses kills the Egyptian and he runs for it, where does he run to? He's in Midian, and he's out there taking care of the sheep, and all of a sudden there's a bush that's burning. Where? On Sinai. Sometime later, they're back on Sinai, and you have the thunderings and the cloud and all of those things. And at a certain point in Exodus, Moses wants to see the Lord. And the Lord, what does the Lord do with Moses? He hides him in the cleft of the rock on Sinai, on Horeb, hides him in the cleft. And lo and behold, when the Lord says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Where is Elijah at? In a cave on Sinai. What did Moses, what was the order given to Moses when Moses was at the burning bush? I mean, after that. Where's Moses going to have to go back to? Go back. Elijah's on Sinai. What's the Lord tell him? Go back. Anyway, I had never put the two, two things together. I don't know how I got on that. <laughs> it's Bruce, it's your fault. <laughs> um, but yes, it, it was Jezebel, Jezebel's threatening of Elijah, um, that sort of language. And so here, Eli, once again, whatever the Lord says, let him do what seems good to him. And what seems good to the Lord is to do what? Your sons are dead. The ark is going to be gone. And you, you know when the, ark, when the ark is taken later on, namely when Jerusalem has destroyed the captivity, and you have this vision, and is it Ezekiel who sees the vision of the glory of God departing? And it's, the glory of God departs. Well, that's you see a little bit of this as well. The ark, it's like uh, the mercy seat, the propitiation. It's it's going to be taken. It's going to be returned um, a little bit after that, but it's going to be taken. Okay, on to the questions. How did Eli's sons not know God? They were rebellious cusses. They were rebellious and they did not follow God. They knew of God. They knew of God like the devil knows of God. But it doesn't mean they have a good relationship with God. The people abhorred the offering of the Lord. Why and was this right? Well, 
right? They were not worshiping like they were supposed to. What I, what I was thinking about with that question, when things... Oh, I debate to bring this up. I'll bring it up anyway, just so you know. This is, this is reality. I was, I was at a certain place, and someone did not like me one bit. And when I taught class, this individual would go and hide in the basement during class. And it's like, no, no. When, when, when things are not good in a congregation, maybe not good with preacher, maybe not good with the elders, maybe not good with members, whatever it is, if things are not good, what should you, how should you still view worship? Study and worship. How should you view it? It's your responsibility, and it's like you do the best you can do. And it's like the first commandment is to love the Lord thy God. And you may not like the teacher, you may not like the preacher, you may not like the elders, you may not like whatever. But what do you still do? And it's like, I'm coming to worship God. I'm coming to do the best I can do. And I'm going to, it's like, obviously I need to work on loving my brethren and loving my enemies and all sorts of things. But anyway, the people, they hated, they hated what was happening and it was causing them to hate the offering. And it's like, yeah, you need to get your mind right. You know, you do the best you can do and their, their sin is on them. Don't sin in the, in the process. Anyway, that just wanted you to think about that idea. Uh, question number three, explain the concept found in the first half of chapter 2 at verse 25. If one man sins against another, God will judge him, but if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? What is that concept? We touched on it last week. Go ahead, Rudy. Do what now? But what if we sin against, and, and the, the point is, for example, even with Jesus, when you get up to Hebrews and it says, for if we sin willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice. And it's until you're ready to repent, Yeah, and um, anyway, you might just think about that. That's Hebrews that talks about if we if we sin willfully, and, and the whole point of that willful sin is when First John talks about those who practice lawlessness. It's not just a simple sin; it's continuing in sin and refusing to repent. And that that's what was happening in in Eli and Eli's house. What is question for? What is meant by the Lord saying? Uh, to Eli and his, that Eli and his sons were kicking at God's sacrifice in chapter 2 at verse 29. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering? Go ahead, Bruce. I was going to say, they, they despised it, abhorred it. They didn't treat it as good. Right, yeah, it's common. They profaned it, that, that idea. Question 5, how could Samuel minister to the Lord yet not know the Lord? Like we said, he's young. He, he, did, what he, he did what he could. I don't know exactly what Samuel's duties were as a little kid. You know, he's probably not being entrusted with what the older priest would be entrusted with. So, anyway, here he is. He's doing what he could, whatever it was. Uh, question number six, is there a difference between Samuel not knowing God and Eli's sons not knowing God? Like we said, there's a difference between ignorance and ignoring. And that's not, you know... You don't blame someone so young for not knowing. Question seven, how could Eli have restrained his sons? Remove them? Stone them? Something. Um, right. Um, I was trying to think, are there examples? Nadab and Abihu, obviously, when the Lord smote Nadab and Abihu. 
I was trying to think if there were other examples of priests being taken out. Probably the wrong phrase. Um, yeah, but he's not a he's not a priest. He's taken out. Yeah, lots of people were taken out. Um, Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was just trying. What I was trying to go through in my mind was how Eli, what he could have done, how he could have removed them. And I kind of keep coming back to, you got to stone them. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, that's the law. That's that's how you remove them. You can't just demote them. I guess is what I was wondering. It's like I, I can't think of an example where someone's just demoted. It's like, no, they, they need to be stoned. They're that's what they're doing. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uses that word banished. Something along those lines, though. Yeah. Which that's, um, you can look at the, the family, and that's what I should have done, to look at the family tree on the back page of the lesson. And if you get real close with a magnifying glass, there's a verse in there in First Kings. And so, yeah, good point by Mark that, Who's the king who deals with that? Who'd you say, Mark? That that's. It's Solomon. Yeah, because it's after it's kind of been in and in the first part of Solomon's reign where he's cleaning up a lot of uh, <laughs> different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, what temptation did Samuel face as he feared telling the vision to Eli? Like y'all have already said, he could have been silent, could have lied, he could have sugarcoated it, could have done all sorts of things, and we can do the same thing, and preachers can do the same thing. And um, it's an issue. Oh, we still have a minute or two left on the back page. We'll just go through these fairly quickly. If anyone made any notes for what these verses were, the first category was family issues. What's the Matthew 10 passage? Anyone? Okay, it's whoever loves mother or father or sons or daughters more than me is not worthy of me. The Mark 10 passage. Believers have many brothers. Yeah, there's no one who has not left brothers or sisters or houses who now in this time, and he, he's talking about the kingdom, that they will find brothers or sisters. It's like he's talking about the relationship of of believers, family issues. Acts 5, that's the account of Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife who conspired together. Weren't they a team? Ephesians 6, children obey. Right, Fathers do not provoke them unto wrath. 2 Timothy chapter 3, that's the passage that talks about the apostasy and of all those traits when it talks about men will be lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, some of the things that are said in there is that they will be disobedient to parents. And I think that's where some of the translations, it also includes without natural affection. And you just might think about when children don't love their parents and don't honor their parents, and when parents don't love their children and discipline their children, and it's that is how it naturally should be. Uh, God's judgment, Matthew 24, no one knows the day, or, the day or hour. Mark 9 speaks to the eternity of hell. If your hand offends you, better to cut it off than to go where the worm does not die. 2 Corinthians 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Hebrews 10 is that verse sinning, about sinning willfully. 2 Peter 3 is the day of the Lord. That uh, earth, the world and... Elements burned up. Listening to God. Um, Matthew 11, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Mark 4, 
Mark 4 and Luke 8 are similar but subtle differences. Mark 4 is take heed what you hear, and Luke is take heed how you hear. So you might think about it's not just what you hear, but it's also how you hear it. Hebrews chapter 1, and actually I'd like to read this one. Come over to Hebrews chapter 1, and we'll close out with this, and we'll start in the lesson 3, or whoever. Brad. Brad's going to be teaching class. Do you know if he's going to be doing this, or is he going to do his own thing? He's going to be here this week. Okay. I might be at a baseball game. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1 at verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. All through the Old Testament, God spoke in various ways. For Moses at Sinai, burning bush. Elijah at Sinai. What is it? There's, there's. Oh, I can't, I can't ever remember the order. There's an earthquake. But God's not in the earthquake. There's a fire. God's not in the fire. There's a wind that tears into the mountain. He's not in the wind. And then there's a still, small voice. With Samuel, he comes and stands by him. Samuel, Samuel. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. Now, how does he speak to us? Jesus. And that kind of points to there's not going to be future prophets. It's like, it's the Bible. For people who think, oh, there's a modern day prophet. No, this is one of the verses that deals with that. Anyway, appreciate everyone's help, attention tonight. Hope it was, hope it was edifying for you and ready for lesson three.